So, uh, my name is Brad Barnhorst. I have been teaching at the sales for a little over a decade now. Uh, I do teach in the MBA program, so if you go back for your MBA, you could have me for uh, you know, corporate finance as well as, uh, don't tell anyone yet, but we might be doing a, uh, a one credit blockchain course, so you could even take this for credit. So, um, the, uh, just to give you a little bit about my background, I did work on Wall Street. Uh, I worked at a company called Bear Stearns, as some of you may remember. It wasn't my fault. My desk was profitable. <laughs> but uh, but I, uh, after working at Bear Stearns, I did come back uh, to academia, where uh, I, I really enjoy working with students because, uh, for me, the learning experience, and I learned just as much as being, from being a teacher is hopefully, uh, you know, you learn from me. So, so I, certainly if you want to reach out afterwards, uh, if you have any follow-up questions or anything, always please, please let me know. Because uh, that way I can develop, uh, you know, my materials as well as uh, get to know other people. So, um, you know, I, I thank you for having me here today. I'm very much looking forward to it. So, the ins and outs of cryptocurrency and digital assets. So we actually went back and forth on this name a little bit. Um, I do have a DACFP if you're wondering what that is, the, the Digital Asset Council for financial planning. Uh, so digital assets um, versus the word cryptocurrency. So digital assets is a little bit of a broader term. Uh, also, some people get a little bit uh, scared when they hear crypto, right? Like crypt, like ooh, wait, that's like a graveyard or something. Like what's that mean? Now the crypt in crypto is of course encryption, right? It, it, it has to do with codes and computers. And, and codes and computers are, are at the core of what's going on. Uh, now, digital assets include more than just currency. So we're going to talk about how some of this can be used as currency, but there are other uses as well. And uh, so we want to look at the whole broad space because if you, you know, if you have clients, if you're a financial planner, or if you're thinking about it yourself, you might say, well, what are some of these things, right? In fact, let's take a look at a couple headlines. And these headlines are actually from three days ago, but something broke today I actually saw, right? There was an exchange uh, that deals mostly with uh, video game assets. But these are, are video and it, it's an exchange called Ronin that uh, they think that the assets are actually totaled uh, worth multiple millions of dollars that hackers were able to stole, uh, steal uh, using compromised passwords. So it's in the news today, uh, and we'll talk about you know, what did they steal? Did they really steal anything of value? How did that happen? Is that going to happen to me? All those are great questions. So hopefully we can, you know, address it with, um, you know, some of the knowledge that we're going to talk about today. So some other uh, headlines. Uh, global crypto economy holds above $2 trillion. $2 trillion worth of valuation in these assets. Rio de Janeiro said that next year they will accept cryptocurrency payments for taxes. So we do actually see uh, many uh, governments embracing or specifically shunning certain types of cryptocurrency for either their use or for their citizens' use. And Madonna buys a bored ape for over half a million dollars. Uh, uh, Madonna's on the right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so the board ape. What, what is this board ape thing? What is this? You know, this this uh, this art that you can buy, and it's kind of like art that you don't even directly own. It's digital art. What does that even mean? So, all of those. That's an example of a digital asset that itself is not a currency, but just like you would buy a uh, you know buy a, a painting to own the Mona Lisa, but it might be a forgery, right? Unless it's in the Louvre. Although some people think even that one is questionable, right? There are many forgeries in the real art world and one of the things that cryptocurrency allows is to actually show ownership to prove ownership and to prove that it's the original authentic thing which is which is very interesting but also creating some very interesting art as well yes so it all starts with bitcoin Right, Bitcoin goes back, so it's about a decade old. No, I can't believe it's you know, over a decade ago. Uh, the first white paper on Bitcoin. So it started off as an idea. All right, and uh, we actually still don't know officially who came up with the idea, or whether it was a group of people. Right, so there was a white paper published with a a, a name that isn't you know people guess as part of the guessing in front of the mysterious you know who came up with this idea, and uh, but but the, the general framework on which it's built is something that it, computer scientists have been studying all the way back um, really to, to Alan Turing and the bombs of uh, 
uh, you know, at Bletchley Park in uh, 1945, or before that, really, during World War II, right? The, the um, uh, in an encryption. And here you see a picture of the Bitcoin logo on, bit co on coins, but that's not really what Bitcoin is. When you're buying Bitcoin, you're not buying a physical asset. This is actually a hexadecimal version of the Bitcoin Genesis block. The Genesis block is the first block that was put on the blockchain that is at the core of what Bitcoin is. All right? and, and this Genesis block is actually still attached today because the underlying technology right, is actually a historical record of what has happened to each of the Bitcoin right, throughout the entire life of Bitcoin. And the Genesis block, you know, Genesis origin, right, is the beginning. So that's still on the record that is traded for every Bitcoin that is traded today. So when you say, what does a Bitcoin look like? That's kind of the closest you're going to get to it. That's what a Bitcoin looks like. It exists in a digital space. All right. Now that said, I have seen actually coins that have been printed with uh, an identifier on it that can, as a physical Printing, uh, just like your, your, you know, if you pull out a dollar bill, it has a serial number on it, right? Well, bitcoins, there are ways of identifying bitcoins using effectively that serial number, and you can look up in the ledger who owns it. Mm, I'm being a little bit nebulous here, and that it's not always easy to see exactly who owns it, but you can see what account it's in, effectively. All right. So, so what's going on with, with uh, what is bitcoin? What is bitcoin? Uh, at its core. It is a rare item that you can, uh, there, well, every Bitcoin is fungible, right? Every Bitcoin is, um, fun, you know, the technical term fungible means just like a, a dollar bill, right? If I give you one dollar bill versus another dollar bill, right, to pay for something, every dollar bill has a serial number, but do you care what serial number is on that dollar bill, right? Typically, no. There are some collectors who look for rare serial numbers, by the way. If you ever do get a really funky serial number, you can actually sell. Uh, sell your bills. But for the most part, one dollar bill is just as good as another, yes? In the same way, Bitcoin is just as good as another. One Bitcoin is indistinguishable from another Bitcoin. And so that's one of the reasons it makes it as a potential currency. The other big difference for Bitcoin is that it potentially enables decentralized finance. So decentralized finance is a way of interacting with finance without going through the major players, right? Who are the major players? Your banks, right? Your, ex your stock exchanges, right? The major, your credit card companies, right? So decentralized finance, how does this enable us to actually bypass those institutions if we want? And there are pluses and minuses to if we choose to bypass those institutions. So what are some popular digital assets? So Bitcoin, classic logo. Yes, Bitcoin uh, is by far the most in total value, right? In market cap, if you will. Uh, Bitcoin leads, and it was also the original. Ethereum. Ethereum is second by market cap, and by a large degree, right? We have hundreds of billions of dollars in each of these, the other ones I'm going to show you, typically the markets for each of them are under $100 billion, although still relatively large. XRP is another coin. You might, may or may not have heard it. Tether. USD coin. Dogecoin. And another example would be Bored Ape NFTs. Now, all of these have something in common, but all of them are also a little bit different. All of them are built off of the same underlying blockchain technology that enables certain degree of transactions as well as a certain degree of security, decentralized finance. They all have something that they're used for. So for instance, Bitcoin particularly is used as a currency, but frankly, it's better to think of it more like gold. Okay, there are certain features of Bitcoin that are less than ideal for day-to-day -day usage of a currency. And we'll, and we'll talk specifically about what makes useful currency. I've already mentioned one thing, fungibility. And Bitcoin has that, right? That the idea that one can be exchanged for another. Ethereum is a little different. 
So Ethereum, while you can exchange it, and just like any asset you have, you can exchange it for money, but Ethereum has on top of it uh, a software platform, okay? And this enables a couple different things that are very neat. Number one, it does enable for more of a distributed global computing type solution, right? You can actually use Ethereum to power calculations. Secondly, Ethereum can also be the basis for, uh, for self-executing contracts, all right? Let me give you an example. Uh, when you buy a house, right, expensive house, and you have money, and the other person has the house, and you want to exchange, but you don't necessarily trust each other, do you, right? I mean, I'm about to hand you $1 million, and you're going to hand me the keys to the house, hopefully, and the title and deed to go with it, right? So how do we handle that in traditional finance? We use, shout it out, title, title companies to make sure they have the title, but how do we do it when you do the exchange? You have to put it in writing. escrow, escrow, right? Escrow, you have to put it in writing too, that's, that's true, again, not just a handshake, but we put it in escrow, right? We put it together at an institution that we trust, right? We have to have an institution that we trust that holds it and then make sure that both sides are fulfilling their side of the agreement and then the transaction occurs. Ethereum allows this to happen without a standalone escrow agent. So you can actually create contracts that have conditions and then based upon the large network observing those conditions being met, the contracts can actually then self-execute and someone can get paid or some asset can be transferred, which is just amazing what that could potentially enable. All right, and there's lots of things that can be built on top of this Ethereum software platform. Next, please. XRP is actually used for currency and payments. So Bitcoin has some issues with it. The bit, as I mentioned, it's got a record on its blockchain going all the way back to the beginning. And this means you can't use instantaneously Bitcoin. It's, it's not able for me to say, all right, here, let me give you a Bitcoin, and within you know, right, a millisecond, it gets transferred. It actually takes time for the block to be updated and propagated through the entire network to recognize who's the new owner of that Bitcoin. Right? And do you like sitting around for 15 minutes waiting for your groceries to officially get paid for? Right? No, of course not. You want to buy the groceries and head on out. So other coins have been developed that, are, that, that resolve faster or are better used for, for uh, various transactions and other payments. Tether adds another functionality. Tether is a stable coin. So a stable coin takes out of the, uh, the equation the fluctuation of the value, right? Bitcoin, I liken more to gold. And sure enough, we can look at the price of gold as it fluctuates day to day, right? Especially in these trying times, right? Um, it makes it a little bit rough to pay for things in gold, right? There's a couple reasons why we don't pay for things in gold. One of them is right, an, uncertainty, an uncertainty in what the conversion ratio should be. In the same way, Bitcoin, as the price fluctuates, it's hard for us to post our prices in Bitcoin. Something like Tether tries to fix that by being a stable coin. Stable coins are typically pegged to a particular currency, and they have different mechanisms to enable the price to remain steady. Right, relative to a, current, to a currency. And there's pluses and minuses to that, but I sh I'm sure most of you can agree, for a day-to-day -day transaction standpoint, stability is useful, right? Lest we all have the whole wheelbarrows full of dollars to buy a loaf of bread sort of situation, right? <laughs> Next one, please. A USD coin is another stable coin, of course, pegged to the US dollar. Um, but but there, you know, there do exist, by the way, I'm showing you just a small handful all of the available coins because the underlying technology that, is, that, that was brought to us in Bitcoin has a allowed a whole ecosystem to spring up. The question though is which of those is going to be the winners and which one's going to be the losers, right? There are hundreds if not thousands of coins. How many of them are going to be around one year, two years, five years, ten years from now, right? Will Bitcoin still reign or will some uh, one of these other coins have features that allow it to surpass Bitcoin? Dogecoin. So Dogecoin is the most, by market cap, uh, most valuable of the meme coins. You want to know what a meme is? If just, you know, yeah, a couple of people shaking your heads yes. Some of you are saying I have teenagers, so 
they tell me what memes are and you know. So, right, memes are, they, they actually, you know, just as genes are to genetics, memes are to thoughts. But specifically around the internet, they're viral, sometimes used, viral ideas that are passed around. Sometimes they're pictures or videos or, uh, you know, have captions on them and whatnot. So Dogecoin was created just like a Bitcoin on the same kind of Bitcoin infrastructure, but attached to the Doge meme, right? That there's, so, so you might say, well, why? Well, what's the point of this, right? Um, so, right? Remember Beanie Babies? Remember the Beanie Baby craze? And some of the early Beanie Babies were like trading for, you know, thousands of dollars or whatnot as people were collecting them. Well, why? It was a fad, right? Why Beanie Babies and why not something else, right? Throughout history, right, I'm sure everyone can remember through the, I don't know, uh, Cabbage Patch Kids when I was young, I remember there was the big run of those and, you know, and, uh, or, you know, slap bracelets or whatever, you know, all the various things that have guys tried. But Dogecoin, the reason why they attached it to a meme was to gain popularity. Because a lot of this is, is it's through network effects where you have to get buy-in, right? You have to get everybody accepting it, right? And currencies only work if you accept it, right? Just, just ask anybody, right? Is anyone going to be willing to take rubles anytime soon? <laughs> right? Nobody's accepting rubles, and you know, it's bad if you got them. So it's the same thing here, right? Dogecoin attached itself to a meme to gain popularity, and because of that, got some success. And there have been other coins that have done similarly. Lastly, the Sport Ape NFT. Its purpose is really more for art collection and arguably also to encourage art creation. So um, NFTs have been used for a lot of different art, uh, and not just you know, pictures, but uh, video art. Uh, I know ESPN has actually been taking, uh, so they own, right, they, they own footage of iconic sports moments, yes? And one of the things you can do is buy the digital ownership, if you will, of that sport moment. <laughs> Right, the ESPN footage, the video of that moment. Ironically, ESPN still owns the video. You own the right to say it's yours. <laughs> what does this sound like? It sounds like baseball cards, right? You anyone have baseball cards when they were young, right? You don't own the player. I wish I owned Honus Wagner. I mean, that sort of thing, but you know, but I wish I owned the Honus Wagner card, though, right? That that card is one of the most famous, right, baseball cards, and it has value itself. So when people are investing in, when you hear NFTs, think to yourself art collection. And maybe some of you even have clients who collect art, right? Many collect it because they want to show off their art collection. Some want to say it's an investment for later. And those of you who know, right, if you're investing in art, it's a real uncertain market, isn't it? Right? Maybe you'll get lucky and make a mint, or maybe you'll just have something your parent, that eventually your kids will inherit, they'll look at it and go, ugh, <laughs> getting rid of that, right? Yes. While it's on the screen, I gotta ask, how sure. did that goofy monkey picture end up worth $564 million? Uh, no accounting for taste? <laughs> uh, well, at some levels it is. It's an auction. They, they, these board Ape uh, NFTs are being auctioned. So you can see them, you know, they're, they're offered for sale just on, on sites like eBay um, where you can buy them. Um, you know, at the same thing, be careful that, you know, if you did want to invest, that you do it, you know, you're not buying a forgery. Because people do also try to forge. Because, again, you can go to the Internet and watch the video, just as we talked. You can go to the Internet and see the picture of that NFT. But the question is, can you prove you own it? Right? And anyone who's dealt with collectibles or memorabilia knows that there's actually a, a big business in just verifying that the thing you own is, is real, is the actual thing, is the authentic. Well, once yes. you own it, what do you do with it? I mean, can you, can you frame it and hang it up? Or? Sure. I mean, you can frame the art, but you own the digital proof of ownership. So there's different things, or you can trade it, right? There's different things that people can do. Interestingly, right, one of the things about art that uh, artists complain about, right, is if I make art and sell it, and then all of a sudden I become famous, the next person can sell my art, they make all the money. I guess the artist didn't make any money on that, right? I made all, I mean, the initial purchase, but the real, right, it, the real big sell I didn't get a part of. Interestingly, some of these NFTs can be designed so that the actual artist will get a percentage of any appreciation and value every time that piece of art is sold, right? Which is a very interesting potential way 
of getting, it's almost like a, an artist owning an equity stake, partly, a, partly an equity stake in their own art. Because then as the piece appreciates, they get a, they get a, uh, they get to benefit as well. All right. Now, realize, Board Ape NFT is one of the biggest, there are lots of NFTs out there. How many of them are really gonna shoot up to half a million dollars worth of value? Probably not many, right? What's gonna catch the headlines? The big ones that succeed. But realize this is a very massive, right, ecosystem where there's lots of people because the barriers to entry are relatively low, lots of people are creating these things and knowing which ones are actually going to be in value is, that's where the skill's gonna be, right? And you might say, why would anybody pay half a million for it? But it, it, at some level, right, what, what, should, what price should I pay for something? As long as I know someone else is gonna pay me more for it, that's the right price, right? If I know someone's gonna pay me more, for, you know, more for it someday, then it's worthwhile, right? Value is what we, you know, what we put into it. So I mentioned currency, so let's focus a little bit back on the currency. What are six, the generally six things that we think about with currency? Durability. Right? You don't want your currency to fall apart every time you use it, right? Portability, the ability to take it with you, right? The better the durability and portability, the more useful the currency. Divisibility, making change, right? It's good to be able to make change. Uniformity, or what I said before was fungibility, right? This idea that all the currency is equal with each other, right? Limited supply, right? If we can print as much of it, I'm looking at you, Federal Reserve, if we can print as much of it as we want, <laughs> right? It might not hold its value. And acceptability, and that's the real key throughout all of this, right? Who's willing to accept this thing, right? And that's why you have a lot, right? Uh, uh, Facebook has been trying for years now, and it doesn't look like it's going very well, and it looks like it might not launch, right? Trying to design some sort of digital currency that will then be acceptable. Acceptable to whom? Well, acceptable to their customers, acceptable for the purposes that they need it, but potentially also acceptable to the government, right? That they have to work within, right? So all of these six things are I, for an ideal currency you would have. Bitcoin is, is durable, right? The fact that it's information means it can be moved very easily from system to system. As a consequence, portability actually, right? It's much easier to move a Bitcoin across the world than it is a dollar, right? On your own, right? A dollar requires what? Like Western Union, right? The old, you know, telegram money across the world to get it there, right? But a, a digital asset, as long as you have an internet connection, you can do it, right? Bitcoin has a little bit of issue with the divisibility, actually, right? Because you can break it into smaller Bitcoins. In fact, most Bitcoins are like, you, you do fractions of a Bitcoin, right? But the fact that each Bitcoin's worth so much does cause some issues. And that's why, um, you know, they have built on top of Bitcoin what they call layer two applications. So there are layer two applications that effectively sit on top of Bitcoin to uh, fix some of the currency issues, to make it more usable from a day-to-day -day basis, right? To either improve its portability or its divisibility or its stability, right? Which is kind of the, th the seventh that I left off here, which is ideally a currency would also be stable. I mean, that, you know, ties in with acceptability. The more stable something is, the more acceptable usually it is, but, um, you know, the, a lot of the other coins in the ecosystem we see are trying to fix that issue with Bitcoin. Uh, uniformity is not a problem. Uh, limited supply, interestingly, you can math, this was in the original paper, you can mathematically prove there is a fixed amount of Bitcoin that will ever be created. All right, it is not, that's why relating it to gold is, is a little better, but even gold, we have, right, there's more mining Right? If, if the price of gold gets high enough, we can go try to find more gold in the Earth's crust. Right? Who knows, maybe someday if it gets so high, we'll go and start mining asteroids for gold, right? <laughs> but Bitcoin will only ever have, right, the numbers in like the 20 millions, all right, only have a fixed number that will ever, ever be created. All right? It's mathematically provable. All right? And that's one of the way, very, very key features of Bitcoin. All right. Uh, all right. Well, well, before I move on, questions on currency? Yes. So, the NFTs you were talking about. Yes. How does that relate to like the, the metaverse? 
Is that... uh, well, I can relate to metaverse and ownership in the metaverse. Okay. So that's where a lot of that will, will tie in. So there are games, and again, I mentioned Ronin at the beginning, right? That there was a, so, so that's a, a game or it, it deals with a game where ownership of actual digital assets is a very important part of it and proving that you own it. So yeah, so that can, that can actually play into owning, showing proof of digital assets in the same way you do a title, right? Someone mentioned it, doing a title search, right? You have to have title insurance. When you're doing a home, make sure nobody can claim that they own your home. In the same way when you're in the digital world, because copying is cheap, right? One thing about a home is it's actually hard to like copy it, right? Uh, costs a lot in the materials. Um, not so much online, right? So actually proving that you own that thing is a big key to that. You know, the Biden administration proposed um, taxing unrealized capital gains. Yes. Has there been any discussion as to how that might interplay with what you're talking about here in terms of ability to hide ownership, how do you value? Okay, well, yeah. That's, is, is this the next place people hide money? Like this? That's not, it's, the, it's not the next place, it's the last place. It's the place where people have already tried. So, so you know, all right, jumping ahead, I mean, it's going to be part of this. But um, so, so taxation, so first off, but important part with, with virtual currencies right now, the IRS does treat it as property, not currency. All right, so when you, for tax purposes, you actually have to treat it as property, which means you need the records of every acquisition and disposition of the, the, the asset, all right? So it's treating it like property, not like a fungible currency for tax purposes, which can make record keeping a very big headache. This is actually one of the reasons, you know, a lot of exchanges, the record keeping alone is worth keeping in exchanges. Uh, as far as that, you know, when you buy a Bitcoin, because it's tied to an account, it's, you know, in some ways, it's, it's almost like the old Swiss bank accounts, right? Um, they weren't completely untraceable, right? There were ways to, and of course, once you got, I mean, Switzerland now plays ball, right? In the same way, you know, these accounts, you know, especially the ones held at exchanges, potentially the federal government can go in and can audit. Uh, and in fact, we have had that where, uh, you know, they've, they've, they've done the whole John Doe, you know, showing that people are, are getting these assets and not paying the appropriate taxes and starting to track that down. So as far as using these things to do something like dodge taxes, uh, that, 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 that would definitely be not something I'd recommend for your clients to do. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, but to have people done it, yes. Now, as far as the taxing unrealized gains, we'll have to see what even comes of that. Um, you know, there's, there's a long tradition at the IRS of not doing that, right, of not taxing unrealized gains. So that particular point I, I can't really comment on because I don't know politically how that's going to play out. All right. Thank you. So, excellent. Well, let's talk about it because some of these topics come from decentralized finance. So let's talk about that. Next, and I promise you there will be a long Q&A at the end too to, to capture everything uh, that pops up. So again, as I mentioned, versus centralized. And again, when you think centralized, think about your banks and think about your credit cards, right? There is something very convenient about having a centralized authority you trust, right? One of the nice things is if you pull out a MasterCard or a Visa, right, and use it, or some of the other banks, right, some of the other cards, uh, you know people are going to trust that, right? They trust that when MasterCard or Visa says you have the money and that, that you're gonna get paid, right, they give you the goods and all you have to do is swipe your piece, piece of plastic or you know, stick it in the chip reader, right? Uh, likewise, a bank, right? Checks, right? Checks are an amazing thing, right? Personal checks, I mean, I, I don't know, we don't write personal checks that much anymore, but they are an amazing thing, right? It's a slip of paper with my signature on it and I hand it to someone else and they take it as payment and they turn it over to a bank and the bank goes, sure, here you go, here's some money and then they handle the ledger, right? That's amazing. I mean, the banks get paid for that, right? That's, that's why a you know, big part of what the banking system is in, in the credit card system. So why would people want to get around that? Well, what if, say, the banking system decides to freeze people out, right? Certainly, we already mentioned before, right? Russian citizens are having some of this issue, right? Russian citizens might have difficulty accessing their financial assets. You say, well, yeah, but that's, that's Russia. It's half a world away. What about Canada? Right? This happened in Canada. The banking system froze people out. Now, I'm not getting political. Don't, you know, don't, this is a, you, you may or may not think that whatever was happening there was right or wrong, but you do have to acknowledge Canada 
use the banking system to freeze people's assets. That happened. All right? So some people don't want that. Some people might want that. If, you, if you're in the camp that doesn't want that, decentralized finance is very appealing to you. It's a way to be able to transact, even if you were blocked by player, the, the otherwise authoritative players. Yes? For good or ill, right? This is not me. I'm not casting a vote on the other side here. I'm just saying it's decentralized versus centralized. Right? How does it accomplish that? It accomplishes that through a distributed ledger. Right? Your bank keeps track. Right? Effectively, and it's, more, it's, it's a database, right? It's a database where they keep track of all the transactions so that you, know, you can't double book it, right? You can't withdraw $10 from your account today and $10 from your account tomorrow and have it be the same $10, right? The whole point of the bank is to make sure that there's money in the account before they do it or you know, at least charge you an overdraft for it. With Bitcoin and other, they do it through this, the distributed ledger is actually handled through the blockchain. You've heard me say blockchain. So the distributed ledger actually means all the transactions are seen by the participants on the nodes. And you might have even heard the phrase mining, Bitcoin mining. So what the miners are actually doing is they're handling this distributed ledger through a process, right, through a mechanism called the blockchain. And all of the nodes, all of the miners are out there comparing notes with each other and looking at the transactions that are claimed to happen and basically doing a big mathematical computation. Right? And then they verify each other's work. And whoever does this big mathematical computation first gets rewarded with a little bit of Bitcoin. That's how it works. And that's how a little bit of Bitcoin gets added to the system, is people getting paid to effectively run the system. This takes time. This is why the system can really only be updated every 15 minutes or so. Right? This is not something that is instantaneous, at least with Bitcoin. There are other coins that deal with it in different ways. But the pluses mean that you would actually need to control a large portion of the nodes to be able to take over the system. Right? So as long as there are players that can't get close to 50% of the nodes, Right? The majority of the nodes can actually make sure that the system is staying on course. Right? So this distributed idea, this idea that effectively all of that record keeping is happening over, right, in, a, in a distributed way is essential if you wanted to cut out banks and credit cards and potentially governments. Again, I mentioned it, it does this through what's called a consensus mechanism, right? So every, every digital asset needs to have a consensus mechanism, i.e., how do you know who wins, right? How do you know authoritatively at the end who owns the asset, right? What happens when you have competing claims, right? So, right, if some of the nodes are saying, actually, no, who owns all this Bitcoin? It's, you know, Joe Smith. And everybody else is, you know, the other 90% say, no, 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 right? It's really Jane Doe. Well, the consensus mechanism is there so that all the nodes can reconcile who actually owns that Bitcoin. And I mentioned mining already. How that, how that. So then the question is at the end here, exchanges, question mark, right? We have these digital asset exchanges. And in some ways, they lie in between centralized and decentralized, right? We have many players in exchanges, the exchanges themselves as well as people in the exchanges. And exchanges allow you to get certain benefits that you get from centralized, i.e., right, many exchanges have custodial uh, uh, facilities, right? So you, they, can help, they can basically manage your Bitcoin or other digital assets for you. They can handle your record keeping, right? But there's pluses and minuses to that, right? Bitcoin was designed, you can actually have what's called a digital wallet. It's yours. You have a passcode, only you can access it. No one else in the world can do it. To actually break the code would require all the computers in the world working for a thousand years. So it's not going to happen. What's the downside to that? Well, we were just discussing earlier the story of the man who had 20, 30 million dollars worth of Bitcoin on his hard drive. And then it got thrown away. It's in a landfill. 30 million dollars. It's like if you had $30 million of cash and lost it, right? Very similar. There's no way to access it. That is gone. 
right? An exchange, right? Since they would be a custodian, they might have, right? You would have your password, your credentials to get into the exchange, but then they would be able to be able to track, right, your actual balances and so forth. But of course, many, and you have to be careful about exchange. Not all exchanges are the same. Some of the reasons we're seeing exchanges in the news, right? We're actually seeing exchanges what sponsoring sports arenas. And part of that is the same reason why your local bank, right, why your banks, the big banks in, in New York always have like all the marble and the giant vaults and whatnot. Why? It's so you build trust, right? You're supposed to trust your bank. So the bank needs to give you that air of being trustworthy. The exchanges, that's where they are right now. They need to convince you that, hey, we're trustworthy, right? We're here to stay. One way they could do that is sponsoring a, right, football stadium or a soccer stadium, yes? And the onus is still on you to make sure that they're following all their custodial things, right? That they're, they're actually following their approvals and you know, have their security in place so that they don't get hacked. Also, you end up with something like Ronin. So, oh, how does this transaction get on the blockchain? This is a little, I know the print's small to read here, it's more for the pictures, right? You have a transaction, request and authenticated, right? Done digitally. Now, a block, this is represented by a cube, but when I said a block, you actually want to think about a digital block, like I showed you before, like that was a hexadecimal, hexadecimal representation of a digital block. But a block is representing the transaction is created. It's sent out to the nodes who then verify it. They have to validate whether or not the transaction occurred properly. If it is, right, it's added to the blockchain and the nodes get a reward for doing that. And that's what we call mining. The block is updated, it's sent out to all the nodes, and then the transaction is complete. And that takes time. That takes time. Which is why Bitcoin itself Best to think about more like gold, in the same way a gold transaction is going to take time. It's not something you're going to use day to day. So what are some major questions going forward? I'm going to give you some questions and then we'll do a Q&A. Yes? Yeah? So major questions going forward with it. Well, which assets are going to attract the most investors? Right? Right now we already have fragmented markets. Right? We have different assets and the question is which one should we use? Right? Bitcoin, Ethereum, a stable coin, Tether, XRP or Dogecoin, right? You also have this issue of forking. How do we actually improve the network, right? There was a big argument on Bitcoin on whether or not they should change the infrastructure to enable the transactions to go a little faster. And half the people didn't want that, right? So you had to get the nodes to agree, and if they didn't agree, what would happen? Potentially even the coin could fork. Some coins could follow one protocol and some coins can follow the other protocol. That can actually be an issue, and that can lead to more market fragmentation. Price volatility. This is a big question, right? So some of the stable coins try to do it tying to a various currency. Of course, if you specifically don't want it tied to the value of a currency, then that's not a solution. So how do you handle price volatility, especially as people are trying to figure out this, right, this ecosystem, right? Try to follow, you know, which, which is going to be stable, a long-term player. Of course, regulation, a big question, right? What governments are going to allow which coins, right? Some, now, the US right now hasn't forbidden people. It's been a little bit more hands off. Although when you read some of the regulations, they seem to be giving a slight preference for Bitcoin, right? They're kind of, it seems to be like, well, Bitcoin we're probably okay with, but some of these other ones, you know, we don't know, right? Different countries though are gonna have different regulations. Tied with that is taxation. Right? How are these going to be taxed? How should they be taxed? Right? How can governments make sure people are paying the right amount of taxes? Of course, I'm sure some people would rather pay less in taxes, and so they're going to try to find ways around that too. So you know, uh, you know, that, that's going to be a big question on how that all plays out going forward. And also in the news is this issue of the carbon footprint regarding some of these digital assets. And I put some acronyms here. POW is proof of work versus proof of stake. So Bitcoin currently uses something called proof of work, which at its core is supposed to be, well, if you have a node running and you have your computer working on the blockchain, right, you get rewarded for that proportionally, right? Proof that you're doing work for the nodes, yes? But of course, computers don't run on nothing, right? Computers run on electricity. So, you know, especially people who are worried about carbon footprints, saying proof of work might be problematic. How much uh, is, you know, these digital assets, how much extra 
drain on electrical resources are we seeing? Now, some of this, interestingly, we're actually seeing um, some countries making cities near volcanoes to take, you know, to actually take the benefit of geothermal energy to actually run server farms to do this, right? So, you know, generally people who are real hardcore miners aren't stupid. They know to go to the places where electricity is cheapest or easiest to access and actually make their investments there. Um, there are even server farms that will turn on or off based upon what the cost of, of electricity is. Versus other models, many other coins use what's called proof of stake, where uh, it's almost like when you have to post a bond, right, to, to do certain things, or like when you hire a contractor who's posted a bond. Proof, proof of stake to a large degree is you have to show that there's a certain amount of money that you've already put into the asset so that you care about what happens to the asset. Right? And then all the people who have a proof of stake can, um, you know, through a various consensus mechanisms, come to a uh, decision as to what to do with the network. And there's issues between both of them, right? Ultimately, though, you need to have a limited resource, right? That's always going to be the issue. With proof of work, even though computing is the resource, ultimately, electricity prices are the rare thing, right? Since we live in a world, right, this is the, the core of economics, we live in a world with, with limited resources, so there's always going to be some resource that is your choke point. And part of this proof of work versus proof of stake is trying to balance that and do it in a way that is, you know, relatively green. <laughs>